And anyway, and I'm not going to waste any time. Eric Capuano, everybody. Okay, I appreciate it, guys. Hey, um, so <clears throat> thanks a lot for coming to my talk, especially being, you know, noon on Sunday, final day of con. I know that a lot of people are already on planes heading home, so the fact that you guys are here with me uh, is very humbling, so thank you. Um, I'll just go straight into it. So obviously you guys know you're here because we all know that tabletop scenarios are not exactly the key way to train for incidents, right? Um, but what do you do about that? If that's all you know, then what other option do you have? So what I'm going to talk to you guys about is something that I've actually done personally with my incident response team because I recognized there was a gap that needed to be filled. Tabletop is not it. And uh, so I built an incident response simulation platform. Now, just so you guys know, you probably saw in the summary of the talk, I, this isn't going to be like just you know, waves and waves and waves of data and things that you've never heard of before. A lot of you are probably familiar with virtual environments and things of that, so, that nature. But I am going to go a little bit deeper and go over some of the, the tips and tricks that I learned in my painstaking process to build this environment to achieve high fidelity training. Right? There's a difference between just building a bunch of VMs and hacking them. No, you, you, in order to really get the most value out of it, there's, there's some things that you want to do to as closely simulate your enterprise environment as possible. So, um, quick introduction. Should be next. So, uh, a little bit about me. I am the SOC lead for the Texas Department of Public Safety. We uh, have 12,000 endpoints, over 467 remote locations across the entire state of Texas. So it's a very large network. Um, we are the state police, the Texas Rangers, Department of Emergency Management, driver's license. I mean, we've got a lot of stuff. So that's a busy job. I'm also a cyber warfare operator for the Texas Air National Guard. Cyber, cyber. Um, in my spare time that doesn't exist, I'm also a private consultant. And I do, I do um, security, information security for small and medium businesses in uh, central Texas and surrounding areas. Um, I'm also a very proud member of the Packet Hacking Village, where I run the Emerging Threats, Honeypots, and Deception System. So if anybody here got to play in the uh, Honeypot Challenges, that's mine. I built that in, uh, with uh, the help of some really awesome people. Um, I'm a Cyber Patriot instructor because I believe that anyone in this field, IT, security, doesn't matter, pay it forward. Because those of us who were once in junior high and high school didn't have somebody to come and teach us this awesome stuff. We had to figure it out. Well, now you can be the one teaching the next generation of professionals. Uh, I'm a part-time blog author. I don't write nearly as much, but uh, Security Against Obscurity is my blog. Uh, you can see the link there. And lastly, and most importantly, I'm just a hobbyist teacher student, just like the rest of you. Uh, and as you can see, everything revolves around caffeine. So ask yourself this, and be honest. Don't tell me, but tell yourself the truth. Is your IR team ready for a worst case scenario? How would you know? You know, how often do you encounter worst case scenario? We're not talking about, you know, macros and, you know, viruses and emails. I'm talking about APT on the network, X filling sensitive data. What do you do, right? You know, does your team have the skill sets that are required to operate in an environment in a situation like that? More importantly than the skill set, but do they know how to work together as a team when the shit hits the fan? Or do they all run off into separate rabbit holes and stop talking? Which is probably more likely. That kind of rolls into the next one. Do they communicate, right? Because I know how my team is, well, the multiple teams I'm on, when they get to chasing something, they go quiet, they go silent. Verbally, and you know, if you're in Slack or some kind of messaging platform, shh, quiet. We're in the middle of a breach. Why are we quiet? We should be talking. We should be sharing information. I know you're seeing things. I'm seeing things. He's seeing things. Why aren't we talking about it? So how well are they communicating? And then lastly, organization, right? And I'm talking, yeah, the boring stuff, the administrative, the hierarchy of the incident response team. Is there a leader? Does that leader know his role? Do the followers know their roles? And are they properly executing? Or is everybody just kind of free for all? And I hope you find something. Hope I find something. So those are the things you should be asking yourself. Because look, even if your daily job is working in a SOC, you're like, oh, I'm not new to this. I respond to incidents all day long. Yeah, you're responding to those routine, mundane incidents that you can do with your eyes closed, right? But it's a totally different situation when you find out that there is a persistent threat on the network. Maybe it's been here for three months and you just found it. 
That's not mundane, that's not routine, and neither should your response to such an incident. So you need to ask yourself, is your team ready for that, oh shit, the data center's on fire situation? <clears throat> Obviously, the point that I'm making here is that a tabletop scenario cannot prepare you or your team for this. Now, it's better than doing nothing, I will give you that, to have a sit down and talk to your team and say, okay guys, here's what's happened. There's a hacker on the network right now and he's attacked our SQL database and we're pretty sure he's exfilling records right now over DNS. What would you do? We'd block him, we'd stop him. We'd put in a firewall rule and we'd stop him. Okay, cool, awesome, prove it. Like, you know, how would you, one, even have detected this to begin with? Two, how would you identify what is even happening? You know, like, okay, great, we see a huge, you know, influx of uh, DNS activity, but we don't know what it is. Hackers aren't using clear text. Well, if sheep victims use clear text. But, you know, how are you going to figure out what's really happening and respond accurately? Because in a business environment, you can't walk in, with, you know, the bull in a china shop mentality and just start throwing firewall rules in. You stop business, you're in trouble, right? Now you've got two incidents on your hands. Um, so, you know, Tabletop is great, it's a good start, it can help you identify weaknesses and gaps in your capabilities or your technologies, but it's not enough to really validate, can you function with a sense of urgency when it has hit the fan? Are you validating the procedures that you rely on so closely? Because that's another thing I hate about tabletops is, okay, what would you do? You're getting DDoSed, what would you do? Well, we'd follow the procedure. When's the last time that procedure's ever been put to the test in a real DDoS? No, some CISSP wrote it, hoping it was gonna be effective. It's never been tested. So you're waiting for the day that you actually get DDoSed to find out if your procedures are gonna work. Skills, training, right? I have a sock full of really sharp analysts. I mean, I am so lucky. I was really, really lucky to have the team that I have. But let me tell you something. Even with the experience that all the people on my team have, years and years of experience, the first time we went through our scenario, the first time we sat in the simulation, no kidding, this, is, this network's being hacked. You'd think they were all beginners because all those, years of, all those years of experience and knowledge and all that stuff, it's, for some reason it almost goes out the window and all of a sudden you're panicking. Oh my gosh, like stop this attack. Like yes, they're exfilling records. Even though it's a simulation, it's funny because it has the same effect. You put a time constraint on this, be like, you have six hours, stop the breach. It, it really does something to the, to the heart rate. You know, and so my team that's not new to this responds to incidents all day every day, all of a sudden couldn't remember that Palo Alto has many different tabs to click on to see traffic logs, threat logs, URL filter logs. They forgot all of that and they did not find the exfil. So the validation of your skills and your training, you know, tabletop is not gonna cover that. And then lastly, right, Tabletop, since you're not validating or tr actually doing anything, it's not gonna highlight where your technology might fail you. It's not gonna highlight where your personnel might not have enough coverage. You got one guy on your incident response team, sure, he's gonna do great at a tabletop, he just has to answer questions. Now I'll throw him into the mix with a real incident and see how many hats he's gonna have to wear and how quickly he's gonna quit. It doesn't work. And you know, one quick point. Think of this, the tabletop, why it's inadequate. Let's take something like paramedics, for instance, first responders. Imagine if first responders trained to respond to life-threatening situations simply by sitting down with colleagues and talking about it. You know, hey, you drive up on an accident and there's someone that's been ejected from a vehicle. They're bleeding profusely, what would you do? I don't know, I'd put on a bunch of bandages. Okay, cool, awesome, that's what we'll do. No, that's not, that's not how it goes. They go and they train. Is anyone here CPR qualified? Awesome. What did you have to do in your training to become CPR qualified? A lot of uh, physical testing. Physical testing on a, on a dummy, right? Yes. Why couldn't you just watch some videos, taking a CBT? Give you your muscle, memory. muscle memory, absolutely. Because there is no CBT, there's no video that's gonna, that's gonna give you that sense of feel. What does it feel like to do chest compressions, right? What does it feel like to breathe air into an unresponsive person? If you've never felt that, you've never done that, you're not gonna be ready when someone's dying in front of you. 
Your heart's going to be racing. You're going to be panicking. You're going to forget the video you watched. But you know what you won't forget is that muscle memory of do, 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 do. That's going to come in handy. That's going to come in handy. So it's the same concept. It's the exact same concept. Firefighters don't learn to fight fire by watching videos on YouTube. Because when they run into a burning building, fear sets in. Panic, you know? So that training has to be muscle memory. It has to be instinctive. Incident response is the same way. And no, I'm not saying that incident responders, you know, are, are paramedics or are firefighters. No, lots of respect for what those people do. But incident response is very similar in the nature that if you don't know how to do it in the calm, you're definitely not going to know how to do it in the chaos. So let's get to the good part. And just so you know, this is not a very slide-heavy presentation. I didn't want it to be. So I'm going to go, I'm going to pull up some diagrams and I'm going to talk about them for a while. So I hope you all are good with that. <clears throat> so my advice for how to effectively train for digital forensics and incident response is attack your own network, sort of. Obviously, we don't want to do this in production. So we build it, right? We build an environment. And let me tell you something. Um, I was able to build a pretty sizable environment on two bare metal ESXi servers. We're not talking about a cluster. I'm not talking about a full rack and a data center. I'm talking about two one U servers. I was able to build a very, very high fidelity and, and elaborate environment. So this is something you could do on a budget. This is something you can do with yesteryear's hardware that you've replaced you know, with your latest refresh and it's just sitting in a closet somewhere. Grab that stuff. Bring it into an area and start building out an environment. And I'm going to go over some of the things that you're going to want to think about when you're doing this because, yes, there's a right and a wrong way to go about it. So <clears throat> I'm going to kind of start from the left and work over. So my decision was to actually have the ability to connect this range up to the, the no kidding internet. And the reason that I wanted to do that is because that makes it way easier for me to have organic traffic generation. Because think about it, right? If you're responding to an incident and you know, you're coming through firewall logs and all kinds of good stuff, uh, it'd be really easy to find a bad guy if there was no web traffic, no activity at all. You just sit there and just wait for the first log to roll by and oh, there it is, we got it. No, for a high fidelity environment, you need noise, just like in the real world. Who's here, who here has ever tailed the logs of their perimeter firewall? Maybe once, right? <laughs> Never did it again, because there's no, you're not going to find anything, because there's just going to be millions of lions just screaming by. So you need, to, you need to reproduce that, or else you're not doing good training. So I decided to have, OK, I wanted the ability to connect this range up to the internet, because when I get to the part later about how we generate traffic, you'll see that internet access is kind of required. However, I'll give you a trick here in a minute just in case you don't have that internet access. It can still be done. <clears throat> um, and also, I wanted to share a quick resource. So while building this, I had to solve some problems like how do I generate traffic? I wrote a, a Python script. Uh, it's in my GitHub. Um, if you can just remember my first, my first initial E and my last name, which is almost impossible to remember, you can find me on GitHub, uh, Web Traffic Generator. It's just a little simple Python script that you can feed a seed of URLs to, and it will literally headlessly browse the internet, just, and it'll go a specific depth. So say, start at these five websites and go to a depth of 10. So it'll start at yahoo.com, and it's going to click 10 links in. And, and so it's a really cool way to generate organic web traffic. Because, guys, you cannot, you cannot leverage canned TCP dump like playbacks. And let me tell you why. Because what we're using here, just like in our real environment, are stateful layer 7 firewalls, right? Layer 7 firewalls, well, actually, any stateful firewall is not going to play nicely with your canned TCP dump traffic. You're not going to just be able to replay PCAPs and have these firewalls pass them. It's not going to work. So unless you've got a breaking point, which I, I usually don't drop brand names, sorry, but unless you've got a very expensive system that was built to do that, you're not going to be able to. So what you need is you need real traffic. You're not going to be able to fake this because your firewalls are not going to care. So anyway, so traffic generation, and I have another tip for you guys on that one in a minute that's even easier than my script. Um, the next component in this, in, this, in this mix would be what would be your external and your, your external router, but this dotted line right here indicates kind of where this range starts and stops from the perspective of your CSERT responders. They are not aware of anything to the left of this dotted line. So this router here serves a very unique purpose. You're using that, and that could be anything. That could be a Vios router, previously, or Viata. 
That could also be a PFSense firewall. You don't need any special gadgetry here, but you do need something that can route because what you're doing there is route manipulation. So again, right, the, the, the effectiveness of this training is gonna be how well can we emulate the things that you're gonna see in the real world? Well, it's really hard to emulate C2 traffic to Russia unless you have a VPS in Russia. So what we can do is in this router here that your, 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 your participants aren't even aware of, in this router we're setting up some destination NATs, right? You can NAT an entire slash 16 if you wanted to of, you know, a, a known Russian IP space. You could just NAT it to a server that you've got sitting up here in your fake internet, you know, which is just another vSwitch, fake internet. And so what I can do then is I can have C2 from any of these systems here going to a no kidding Russian IP but it's not even leaving my range. It's just once it hits this router, it's getting destination added to a server that I've got listening up here. Why is that good to do? Why is that useful? Well, because we want to generate the same or similar types of artifacts that an incident response team should be looking for. So if you can't simulate traffic to Russia, well, I mean, you know, uh, that's, that's definitely something that, that it, it, you're that would add a lot of value to the training. So, um, but again, I mean, Russia, that was kind of a, an obvious point, but maybe something less obvious, you know, but the point is, if your organization doesn't do business outside of the country, and you throw something in there, even something simple, you know, um, you know, Great Britain, UK, you know, uh, France, whatever, it should still be anomalous. If, you're, if, you're, if your incident response team is looking at it, hey, why are we talking to this country that we don't even do business with? So anyway, um, so the other thing that that we're leveraging this, this router here for is you can hijack DNS. So if for whatever reason you want to stand up, you know, um, a site like a paste bin clone, which actually we did in our scenario, we, uh, we, we created pwnbin.ru, which our, our, our red team uh, infiltrators use to exfil data. Well, to create that record outside of this environment, because you don't want your incident response team to log into the firewall and be like, oh look, there's a static DNS entry for pwnbin.ru. I bet that's gonna be used for something. You create it out here. You hijack DNS out here. Maybe you get a little DNS server up here that's responding to those queries. I could hijack Google, I could hijack Yahoo, I could hijack anything I want. So now I can, I can further manipulate what's going on in this environment to make it do what I want it to, to achieve my training objectives. Um, the next thing, oh, and also I, I wanted to highlight some of the resources that I'm using in my environment. So obviously, this is also where your attackers live, right? So you're going to need someone to red team this, in, this engagement. Um, and so your red team guy literally could have one Metasploit box, one Kali system sitting up here in the fake internet, and he's got a handful of uh, interpreter handlers on it, and all the C2 and all the bad stuff that's going on in here is literally, it could, it could appear to be going to a hundred different IP addresses, but it's all getting added to this one guy up here, and one dude's red teaming this entire engagement, which is also a ton of fun. But, you know, patchy web server running a bunch of virtual servers for your special sites and services. You want to fake Twitter? Set up a fake Twitter up here. You want to fake Facebook? You know, you can do all of that up here using very simple things. Another thing that I'm doing in my fake internet is, so, to really, to really add additional realis realism to this environment, email, right? Email is the number one vector. It is, that's how they get in, is, you know, social engineering, you know, someone got an email that they trusted, they believed in, they popped it open. So you need the ability to send email into this environment. So we've got a Python script, literally, that's just sending lorem ipsum every minute to every single user in our fake environment. That way, when we send that one malicious email through, it just blends in. It just blends right in with all the other noise. So, you know, we're leveraging some pretty simple concepts here. Um, let's see. Okay, so the next piece in this puzzle is your perimeter firewall. Now, here's the thing. I, I meant to touch on this a little earlier, but so here's the thing. When, when you're approaching this and you're going to build an environment, you, you need to figure, there's, there's a component you need to figure out first. If you're building this on the cheap, obviously you're gonna lean more towards open source solutions, which if you've been to my previous talk, I'm all about open source is awesome, right? A lot of really powerful commercial tools run on open source engines, so what's the difference? However, know that you know, the, the, the effectiveness of the training is going to be tied to how closely 
does this mimic your production environment? So there's a lot of value in trying to reproduce. So for instance, if you use you know, FortiGate firewalls, it would probably be a good idea to try to get FortiGate virtual machines in here and use those because that is another way to one, train your incident response team, to two, validate how good are my FortiGates anyway? Have you ever really put them to the test? Do it in here where the stakes are, are not high. Well, know that you don't necessarily need to go out and buy licenses for all this stuff. Tell your vendor what you're doing. Hey, John, Fortigate, listen, man, I'm building a training environment to make my guys better at what they do. Can I get a complimentary license? I'm going to tell you right now, guys, I've probably, I've probably been given $200,000, $300,000 worth of free licenses for my training environment. Vendors don't care. You tell them it's a lab, it's offline, it's not production, you're just training with it, they will throw product at you. So don't be afraid to ask, okay? So when you're approaching this and you're deciding, do I want to use you know, you know, Palo Alto, Fortigate, you know, uh, ESAs, whatever, um, talk to your vendors. You're more than likely going to be given some leeway there. But if you do go the open source route, I'm going to tell you right now, you can achieve everything that I'm talking about here with open source solutions, short of maybe your Windows workstations that you're going to want to break into over here eventually. So um, moving on, so perimeter firewall, um, you, can, you can totally roll like a PF sense if you want to, or you can throw, like I said, a, a virtual appliance of, or even a physical appliance. If you have a little you know, lab unit sitting around, fork that into this environment and use that. But um, what that perimeter file, firewall is going to do is just like in your production environment, it's going to have a DMZ probably with some web applications, some web servers, things like that. Maybe hang a mail security appliance. Whatever you're doing in production, you need to do here. That's it's really the, the, the extent of it. And hopefully, just like in production, you're running IDS IPS here, right? To simplify, the next, the next piece of it is really just like one giant core router to rule them all. Um, and, and it could be, this, it could be you know, a copy of the same device you've got here, or it could be a different device. It doesn't really matter. But that's where you're going to create all your different virtual networks to mimic you know, your different branch offices or divisions or whatever, whatever subsections you have in your organization. And the reason you want to do this is because, you know, remember, during our incident response training, we want to create anomalies. Right? We want to create things that are out of the ordinary, like someone in HR you know, hammering a SQL server. Well, in order to mimic that, we need to have an HR subnet, right? And then the CSERT needs to understand that that is, that, you know, what that is. Um, on your core router, it also would be ideal, hopefully, just like in production, to have IDS IPS here so that you've got visibility on not only your north south traffic coming into and leaving the environment, but east west visibility on. HR talking to the server farm, you know, or IT talking to marketing and sales, right? Now, again, this is cool because when you're architecting this, this very simple network, it starts to prompt questions in your mind of, well, do we really have that visibility in our environment? I don't think we do. You know, we've got a giant, you know, uh, Cisco Nexus, you know, uh, big iron router in our core, and it's not inspecting anything. It's just routing. So we wouldn't know if HR was beating up a SQL server. So this is cool because you're going to accidentally start to think about the, the, the gaps you've got in your own environment as you're thinking about how to build this one. But for the fidelity of the training environment, you know, have these sensors deployed so that they're inspecting everything because we want to have that, that flood of information for our C-cert to have to sift through to look for evil. So server farm, obvious. I mean, I don't really need to go into detail to you guys about what needs to be in a server farm in a corporate environment. But you just want to have those important items like a domain controller, exchange slash mail server, right? A file server, some kind, SIFS, NFS, Samba, whatever. And you know, in my environment, we want, we rolled a SQL server, you know, because most most organizations have large databases, and so we wanted to have one too. Um, branch offices, self-explanatory. But I'm going to go over some cool tips and tricks here. So. Um, back to that, that, uh, that organic traffic generation, right? So first and foremost, you know, what do you put out here? What do you put in these subnets? Well, ideally, you're going to take a copy of the golden image that your organization uses. You know, IT has probably some image that they use to image new systems. Get a copy of that. Use that one and put it in here. Because now, during your training, you're going to be validating the security of that image. How secure is that image? Have you ever really put it to the test? Have you attacked the crap out of it with Metasploit? Well, you're going to get to in this environment. So when you get all these workstations set up, Windows boxes, you know, whatever your, your, your folks are using, I'm going to share something really cool with you, save you some time. Uh, there's a Chrome extension called Chaff, and this thing is awesome. And it literally, it, it, you know, my traffic generation script, it does that. It does it actually even better. 
Um, and of course, I didn't find chaff until after I'd spent, you know, like seven hours writing mine. But chaff is actually really cool because you can install Chrome on each of these workstations. You can tell chaff, you can tell Chrome to start at boot, auto login, start at boot, and chaff will start automatically. And chaff will literally do everything a user will do. Browse the internet, download dumb files, go to YouTube, stream some stuff. I've seen chaff end up in some pretty risky places of the internet, which is perfect. Because during your incident response simulation, you're going to see IPS signatures firing. That you're like, I don't know what that is. It's one of the chaff users. And that's perfect because that's what real users do. They do dumb stuff. And they're going to go to weird websites. And it's going to make your firewall upset. And that's going to make your incident responders have to sort through the noise, right? Which is what it takes in order to be effective at incident response. There's going to be a lot of noise. So chaff, that's one of my, one of my little secrets there. Um, but um, also, it's important that whatever endpoint agents you're using, if you've got an AV, a HIPS, a HIDS, or whatever, um, a log forwarder, um, you want to get that on this image as well, obviously, because you're going to need data. You're going to need information off these workstations going to your aggregation, your SIM, or whatever. We'll cover that in a second, too. Um, so you know, get those, get those, those endpoints configured. You're going to need a mail client on them, because remember, mail, got to have it. You're going to use it in these simulations, the scenarios that we're going to go over in a minute. And then obviously, you want all these guys joined to a domain. That's self-explanatory. OK. So lastly, for this, uh, for this environment, um, you're going to have to build out, you're gonna have to build out your, uh, your subnet for your incident responders. You know? And so typically, you know, I hang that off the same core router, but it is a totally separate subnet. That way, you know, the ACLs, it's permit, permit, you know, any, any, all that good stuff, no IDS, no IPS, because you just want your guys to be able to have a straight shot into the environment. Because later on, as you mature here, right, after you get past the stage of detection, um, can you find the evil? OK, great. You found it. Now, go ahead and, uh, you know, leverage your WEMIC, your PowerShell, whatever, reach into that box. Let's, let's, let's get volatile data. Let's get event logs. Let's get a memory image. Let's, you know, then you can actually start getting into active response on these systems. Um, and so it's good to have them on a separate subnet so that you can, you can permit them to do all of these things. Um, so I'm going to go over a couple, more, uh, a couple more solutions that you guys will want to look into for building out your environment. And actually, to be honest with you, these are solutions you could look into putting into your production environment. So uh, if anyone here is familiar with Elasticsearch, right? Elasticsearch Logstash has a really cool log shipper called Beats. And there's two flavors of it, actually. So there's File Beats, which is just an agent you can put on a system. And you could point it at any log that you want. It could be a, a, a custom log that you wrote for a custom application, or it could be a Windows event log. It could be syslog. It could be auth. It could be any log you want. And File Beats can actually ship those logs to a central repository using TCP with TLS, like all kinds of cool stuff. So it's kind of a step up from your simple R syslog forwarder, right? Which is UDP, it's plain text, it's, you know, uh, what happens if your syslog server goes down? Well, syslog keeps forwarding, it doesn't care, it's just going to keep forwarding. Well, Beats is a little smarter than that. If your syslog server went down, Beats is going to sit there and it's going to store those logs and wait for it to come back up. So really cool tool. And uh, it, it integrates really nicely into Elasticsearch Logstash. Um, Clam AV, which, if, most of you guys are familiar with Sourcefire. It's Clam AV under the hood. Who knew? Um, OSEC, which is a open source HIDS agent. Very, 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 very powerful. I mean, this is an awesome tool. Uh, millions of customization options. You put it on your hosts, and it's looking for rootkits. It's looking for evil, and it's reporting back to a central server. So I'm just going over some of the things that you can look at using in your environment that cost nothing. Um, how about your incident response team, right? Uh, maybe you're in an organization with a ton of money and you've got a really cool sim. Maybe you're not. The good, the good news is you're not out of luck. Greylog, very, very powerful tool. I mean, it is very close to an open source Splunk. Don't, not to be confused, Splunk is awesome. Splunk is extremely powerful, but Greylog comes pretty close and the price is right. Free $100,000. Um, Alien Vault Awesome. If anyone's familiar with Awesome, extremely powerful sim. Um, it's got vulnerability scanning, passive asset detection, all kinds of good stuff. You could put that, you could stand that up in this environment for free. Uh, the Hive, if you saw my talk yesterday, I covered the Hive. Really awesome incident response collaboration tool. So if you've got a team of analysts that are responding to an incident, the Hive is an awesome open source platform for them to collaborate on. Check it out. 
So I just wanted to share a couple tools that you guys could use if you didn't already have uh, these systems in place. Okay, so now that you have your environment, now you have to start scripting your scenarios. And this is, this is one of those things where, you know, it sucks because you might have a team of 10, but you or someone that you designate is going to have to be the lone wolf that's going to have to come up with these scenarios because obviously your incident response team can't know about it, right? It's got to be a surprise. So I actually had my Intel analyst draft up these, these, these Intel reports. They're totally bogus. I mean, it's like 95% fluff and about 5% actionable Intel, just like in real life, <laughs> right? So we, 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 we dreamt up this scenario. Uh, and, and it's important that you pick one that's applicable to your organization, right? Like, so you know what kind of threats your organization faces. I'm a law enforcement agency. We deal with hacktivists, you know, people that don't like law enforcement agencies. Um, and so we, dre we dreamt up a, a hacktivist scenario where um, there's this, you know, this, this group, you know, like anonymous or something that really wants to embarrass large law enforcement organizations. And we got all their TTPs and some, some, some uh, observables that, that have been discovered in the wild oh, and all this stuff. And in and, and all reality, we really are only going to use one or two of the indicators that we provide to these guys. Because just like in the real world, I mean, these intel reports, they're not smoking guns. They're not going to give you all the information you need. But this is to test your team. Are they paying attention? Are they looking at the, the relevant intel that's available for a particular incident? Or are they like, oh, yeah, great, yeah, intel. Okay, cool. No, I can find bad. I've done this before. I'll find it. So this is a test on are they ingesting the information that's available to them to make them more effective at finding a particular threat to the organization. Um, yes, and we'll go over in one of the scenarios ways that you can really, you can really weigh in on, you can test their, uh, whether or not they're paying attention to things like this. So now I, I kind of want to dive into a couple actual scenarios that I've developed that were really successful in training our team. So first and foremost, though, I want to preface with this. Your red team injects. So the attacks that you're going to carry out on your environment, it can't be cowboy. You can't just, you know, wing it. It needs to be scripted. Like it need, there, you need to have a playbook that has repeatable and measurable impacts because for it to be an effective training solution, for every red team inject, there needs to be a blue team observable. So as you're going through and you're, you're mapping out your scenario, you literally need to wear both hats. So, okay, I'm going to try this attack on that system. What did I see on this system when I did that? Oh, okay. Or what did I see in my sim? What did I see in my logs? What did I see here and there? So you need to make sure that everything that you're, that you're scripting for your injects is something that your blue team can even find. If they can't find it, why not? You know, that's, that's a gap in technology. So uh, another thing, um, you know, if you go off script during a red team engagement on, you know, in, in an environment like this, well, now your blue team, like, you're not going to know if they found the bad stuff or not because you don't even know what artifacts you're generating. So that's why it's important to script this out. So that's what we have. We've got playbooks for different scenarios that we're going to run through. So, you know, for instance, here's, you know, and I'll just kind of blaze through these, but... One scenario that we have is we're going to kick off our traffic generation. So we got a ton of noise. We get emails flooding into the network every minute. I mean, hundreds of emails. We got traffic generation. And then we're going to socially engineer a DBA. We got, we got a database administrator, um, poor Regina Buckley. She's, uh, she's been with the organization for years and uh, you know, not the most security aware, but she does all right. Well, we're going to fish her because she likes talking about what she does on LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook. And so we found her. We're going to spear fish her. And um, we're going to send her an email that very urgently tells her to install a Windows update from vendosupdate.com, which it's funny. You can, you know, when you're manipulating DNS, you can create any type of DNS record that you want. So vvindosupdate.com uh, plays really well into your scenario because a lazy analyst that's just kind of skimming through logs doesn't see the, the VV, right? The simple things that attackers do. They're playing on your lack of attention to detail. So when your red team injects, you want to do the same thing. Do things that are going to force your analysts to pay attention to what they're looking at, not to glaze over it. So she downloads this, this, this update, which actually, of course, is a reverse shell that's going to give our red team attacker a shell on her system. So she's here. We're here. We now have a shell on her system. Escalate privileges, get her credentials. We already know she's a database admin, so we already know what accesses she has. So what we're going to do next is pretty obvious. We're going to start enumerating the network. 
Now remember, this is why it was important that we have east-west inspection. Because if we just had a direct link to the SQL server and we started scanning, our blue team's not going to see that, right? So we have inspection for east-west, and we're intentionally going to generate some noise. We're going to scan. We're scanning the server farm for the presence of a SQL server. That's a blue team observable. You know, port scan, 3306. They should find that. They should see that. Well, we found it. We found our SQL server. So from Regina Buckley's system, we now have our creds. We're just going to go ahead and log right into that SQL server, and we're going to start exfilling records. Now, here's the thing. Anybody here, especially red teamers, there are intentional dumbing down of red team activities because, again, when you're first getting started with this, guys, your team doesn't know what's going on. Okay, so if you go in all stealth, you're using an RC4 encrypted payload, and you're, you're exfilling over encrypted channels, yes, of course, your team's not going to find it. So you need to do some things earlier on to enable them, to build up their confidence, to help them find, to know what, what to look for. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab all the SQL records, and we're just going to pull them over to Regina Buckley's system, even though we could have just pulled them right through our interpreter shell and been gone. We're going to pull them to Regina Buckley's system. Through our interpreter shell, we're going to drop curl onto her box. And remember, in our fake internet here, we stood up a pastebin clone called pwnbin.ru. From Regina's box, we are going to, via the API for pwnbin, we're just going to post 5,000 sensitive records right to pwnbin. Because remember, I'm a hacktivist. I'm not in this for the money. I just want to embarrass the hell out of your organization. So I'm just going to post 5,000 sensitive records right to pwnbin.ru. So what additional observables have we generated? Well. We dropped a binary on the system in a protected directory. Um, when we exfil data from the SQL server through the network to Regina Buckley's box, if you've got a halfway decent IDS, it picked up on the fact that 5,000 PII records just traversed the network in the clear. That should be noticeable. Then we did it again. We, we curled in clear text from Regina's system via an API. We exfilled all 5,000 of those records. Now, did we do it the same way an attacker would? No, of course not. An attacker would not have used any of those methods. But remember, to start, your team will be, you're, you're lucky if your team's going to see any of that, if your traffic generation's good, if all the noise is there. If your team sees what the, the scenario I just described, you're better than most. So you got to practice with the intentionally obvious scenarios first. Let your team get a feel for what does, what does abnormal stuff look like. Then you upgrade to the more, the more you know, sophisticated attacks, which if you're not gathering this already, this is a ton of fun for the red team too. So, you know, you build this to train a blue team, but that means that some lucky person gets to be the guy attacking these systems, and that's a ton of fun too. So that, that's one scenario that we've had. Yes? Absolutely, step by step. Literally copy and paste into the red team, into the Metasploit console. We even pre-built Metasploit resource files to automate a lot of the things like, hey, enumerate the SQL database. Well, you want that to be 100% repeatable. So I might have one way of enumerating a network. You might have another. But we can't have those variances when we have a scoreboard that's expecting a specific answer. How many systems did the attacker scan while enumerating the network? That's why it needs to be 100% repeatable. Um, so yes, the playbook is extremely detailed down to the command that the red team is going to run for the inject so that we know exactly what the blue team should have seen. So as we start to migrate to more, I guess, um, more complex scenarios, um, excuse me, dehydrated here. Um, so, or I wouldn't say complex, but different, right? A lot of, a lot of organizations have, like I said, web servers sitting out here in the DMZ. Um, well, how, how sensitive are the systems that are in front of those web servers? You know, if you've got F5s, if you've got, you know, uh, IDS tipping points, whatever, um, are they properly tuned? Are they configured to look for the types of attacks that your systems are most vulnerable to? Well, try it here. So you get a web server, right, that's facing the internet, but it has a back-end connection to the SQL server. Well, maybe that's another scenario where you get an attacker that's beating up this web server, running SQL injects against it in order to do the same thing, to exfil data, to exfil data. Would your team know what to look for, know how to respond to that type of situation. Um, now, this is where things can get a little more complicated, right? When you want to start really upgrading to, to more sophisticated scenarios to put your team to a tougher test, 
That's where you do start using things like RC4 encrypted payloads that are not going to set off IDS IPS. That's where you start using encrypted channels over, you know, uh, you know, normal web ports, things like that. Things that are not going to stand out. They're not going to be obvious. You're not going to be scanning the entire network, making a ton of noise. You're going to be super quiet, super covert, just like a real attacker would. But then how do you throw your team a bone to see how closely they've been paying attention, right? Maybe in a previous scenario, the Intel report had a bunch of IP addresses. And none of them were relevant at the time, just like in the real world, right? But two scenarios later, one of them is, but they haven't even looked at that Intel report in hours. You know, it's, it's in the back of their mind. They're not even thinking about it. But all along, you've had a really slow and quiet beacon sitting on a system on the network. And um, while your team is scrambling looking for things that don't exist, because remember, we're on a stealthier engagement this time, that beacon's just been sitting there doing its thing, and you've got an attacker doing some really dirty things, you know, uh, you name it, your imagination, you know, it's, the sky's the limit. Does your team ever connect the dots to say, wait a second, you know, the threat intel we got six hours ago that wasn't relevant then is relevant now. We've had C2 on this system for, you know, all day long. You know, connecting dots like that, that is analysis. You know, paying attention to the details, not forgetting about previous indicators just because maybe they weren't relevant at the time. That's another effective way to test your team uh, to pay attention. This was a really fun one, actually. This, this one I'm describing, what we did was we wrote ransomware. And we, 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 had a, we had a persistent beacon on one system. We dropped the ransomware executable onto the box. We waited till things got really quiet. The incident response team was distracted, looking for, for you know, rabbits in the rabbit hole. And then we went ahead and we hit the file server. We encrypted every single file on it. And Here's the thing, we, we'd given them intel of exactly what we were going to do. Obviously, you saw the intel document. It, wasn't, it didn't look like a, a really friendly, straight to the point manual, because they're not. But we gave them an intel document that said exactly what we were going to do. They didn't see it coming. What if I walked up to you and said, hey, I'm about to punch you in the face. You have no right to be surprised if I then punch you in the face. I told you I was going to do it. But if you're not listening to me when I tell you, if you're not paying attention, if you're ignoring the signs, you're ignoring the intel, you're, you're not diving deeper into the information you have, you are to blame. And so test your team. Are they using the information that they're given? You know, are they looking out to, to, to gather additional information? You could go so far to use real indicators. So you know, go to OTX, Open Threat Exchange, and find some IP addresses that are tied to malicious activity. It won't be hard. And then use those IP addresses in your environment. Now make sure that your blue team knows that, hey guys, just so you know, the indicators that, that we're using are real world. So now they know that they have an option to go and research on OSINT, OSINT sources. Okay, uh, I, think, I think this activity is malicious. I'm not sure. Let's go, let's go check virus total. Let's go check uh, OTX. Let's go check, you know, threat connect, whatever. And now they can actually enrich the intel because you're using real indicators. So I mean, you know, Put your, your folks to the test on some of the more advanced capabilities that you need on an incident response team. Because just simply playing IP address whack-a-mole and blacklisting things all day, that's not effective. That's not, that's not solving problems. So you get these scenarios written and, you know, You've, you've tested them, you've validated them. Like I said, for every red team inject, there needs to be a blue team observable. How do you measure, how do you validate? And then at the end of the day, how do you make this fun, right? Because if it's not fun, no one's gonna wanna do it, you're not gonna wanna run it. Guys, this is a ton of fun. So when I built this, I built it actually just for my own incident response team. Then B-Sides Austin reached out and said, hey, we want you guys to bring this platform to B-Sides Austin. I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, I'm not gonna say no to that. We brought it to B-Sides Austin, and we had over 40 teams come and play through our scenarios. Uh, we've had Rapid7 guys play through our scenarios, and they loved it. We've got overwhelming feedback about it, because one, they said, hey, this is, this is awesome because this is real world. Like, this is exactly what it's like, you know, being in a sock, looking at incidents. Versus a CTF, which, don't get me wrong, CTFs are a blast, but, you know, a lot of CTFs, you know, puzzles, the games, the challenges, the decrypt, you know, all that good stuff, that's fun, but not directly applicable to what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Whereas this challenge was meant to be exactly that. It's meant to be directly applicable. But we still want it to be fun, enjoyable. We gamify it a little bit. You pull down an open source CTF scoreboard, like this one here. This is actually Google's. Uh, this is the Google uh, CTF framework. And you gamify it. You create a Jeopardy style you know, question and answer board where you break out the categories and like, you know, and I, I hate using this word, but you basically create your own kill chain. You say, okay, you know, the first, the first phase of the attack was the infiltration, you know, then there was the enumeration, then there was the attack, or the, well, actually, attack came before that, but uh, then the exfiltration, right? So you break it out into those categories, and you make them run through the entire scenario, and you give them little breadcrumbs, right? Because, again, it's all about enabling them. You're not going to get any value throwing your team into a scenario that you know is over their head and giving them nothing. So when they're learning how to walk, you show them how to crawl, point them in the right direction, and then get progressively more difficult as you go on. But like I said, a CTF scoreboard, something like that, it's going to gamify, it's going to make it a little more fun, but it also, as someone leading the training, it's going to give you a true measurement of how well is your team doing, how far are they getting. If they're doing it as individuals or if they're doing it as a team, you need to be able to measure the impact that you're making. And that is all I have. So I will open it up to questions. I know that there's a lot of technical information in here, and in the essence of time, I have to kind of skim over a lot of things that were actually six months worth of development and implementation. So I'm, I'm perfectly happy to have a conversation with anyone that wants to know more about how to build this, how to run this. I'll even share my playbooks with you so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, just let me know. But uh, any questions? Yes? So are you talking about like the communication channels to management of the organization or? Oh, okay, absolutely, absolutely. So no, his question is good. It's like, are you, are you including management in these scenarios? So if it's, if it's an incident response like of a, of a large scale, obviously there's more than just the incident response team that's involved at this point, right? You're dealing with these executives, you're dealing with legal, you're dealing with HR and so on and so forth. So uh, honestly, that's not something that I've baked into our simulations yet, but 100% should. Absolutely. This is something my team does on a quarterly basis, but we've only been doing it for three quarters. So we're still growing, we're still evolving, but you're 100% right that to really test like what would we do in this scenario, you're gonna be including your executives. You're gonna be up channeling. So that's, part of, that's kind of part of the organization piece. You know, this isn't just a, te this isn't just a skills test, guys, because I, I don't doubt the skills of anyone in this room and, or any of the people you probably work with. This is a test on when it hits the fan, can you remember the basics? Like, I don't know, talk to someone, document things, right? Or do we all just fall into that, that silo and that, that, we, that rabbit hole of, oh, got to look at the logs. Oh, I think that's bad. Oh, I think that's bad. Oh, I think that's bad. But I haven't written down anything. I haven't documented anything. I haven't told you know, other analysts what I'm looking at, what I'm doing. And I haven't up-channeled to the incident response lead. Hey, you know, I think I see indicators pointing this way. Um, and I might not be on task from what the incident response lead asked me to do. So yes, you've got to factor those things in to really test how effective an IR team is in, in the midst of it. Yes? So that's something that we're still, we're still measuring. So the, obviously the major, the, the major investment here for me was time, right? To build this, yes, it was, it was a sizable investment in time. I'd say there were about three of us working on it. It took us about six months. We were working on it obviously on the side, right? We, we have daily operation to maintain. So, you know, for about six months, we had to build this out. We had to learn a lot of hard lessons. You know, we had to, you know, a lot of troubleshooting. Once it was up and running, it actually became very easy because now all we're doing is we're changing the scenario. You know, hey, instead of a DNS exfil, you know, next time we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. So writing the scenarios now is the upkeep. And that's actually probably the most fun and one of the easier, one of the easier pieces of it. So the upkeep element hasn't really been an issue. Like I said, the hardware, I'm, I'm using recycled power edges, you know, like these things are, you know, no, nothing special. So, you know, it was a very small investment in hardware. And like I said, if you have a good relationship with your vendors, you can go and you can get 
OVAs, or probably even bare metal like lab units of the appliances that you're using in production and get, these in, get those in the environment for no cost at all. You know, get a perpetual lab license. So, I mean, it can, you can do this with a relatively small investment. The, the, the real kicker is going to be the time to build the environment. If you, don't have the, if you don't have the resources on your team, you know, with solid networking skills, solid sysadmin skills and things like that, okay, you might have a tough time. I'll be honest with you. You're going to have a tough time. But I, I think I could, I could say pretty safely that a lot of security folks came from other areas, right? sysadmin, network engineering, things like that. And so, again, I'm fortunate. I have a pretty, pretty you know, uh, wide skill set across my team. So I have network engineers. I have sysadmins. And so we, it enabled us to build this without any outside help at all. But your mileage may vary. Okay, so that would be tough for me because I have 12,000 users. Um, I don't have the, the, those types of resources for this environment, right? I cannot simulate 12,000 people. So, no, obviously, I'm definitely scaling down a lot. But I have found that as long as your traffic generation is organic and it's, 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 it's good and you're, you know, put in some other things. Like, I think in addition to the HTTP traffic, we also put some headless, you know, Python scripts that are, like, doing all kinds of other weird stuff you know, uh, pings, ICMP, you know, and remember we had a file share in the environment, right? So one of the GPOs that we put in the domain was at boot, all those systems mount the file share. So now you've got a lot of east-west, you know, SMB traffic. So you want to you wanna make sure that you're generating as much normal activity as possible, and that takes a little bit of ingenuity. Because if you can do that, you'll find that, at least we found, that it made plenty of noise. And I think... We emulate about 35 or 40 user workstations. It makes plenty of noise. So it's effective for what we're doing. Because if you can effectively filter out 40 active users, it's the same concept to filter out 10,000. You know, it's the same filtering principles, right? So we found it to be effective. What time it is? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so from a, just a, a good security posture, you should have sensors that are detecting user behavior, you know, abnormalities, right? So, you know, Regina Buckley, she's my DBA. I like to pick on. You know, you should absolutely maybe script a scenario where you're setting the time. Okay, guys, it's 1 a.m. Regina Buckley is beating up the database. Now, Regina Buckley is a database administrator. So at first glance, that might be normal, but not at 1 a.m., right? So absolutely, factor these things in. The things that should be unusual, that should be anomalous, that's what you're testing your team on detecting, right? Um, another one that I like to use. So we have a scenario that we called uh, No Worries AV Caught It. I love this one. I love this one because here's what we did. We, uh, we sent like a spam email campaign to every user in the environment, and it had a, mal a malicious attachment, like a grayware, you know? And we made sure that it was going to trigger AV. As soon as it hit the box, AV was going to squelch and be like, no, nah, you're not going to run. What is your, in your SOC today, or your, your IT security folks, or whomever's watching these types of systems, what happens when you see something like that? No worries. AV caught it, right? Who cares? Moving on. But let me tell you what the second half of that scenario is. If you would have taken the sample from AV that it caught and mitigated, if you would have taken that sample, it was just Visual Basic, you know? You know, you would deobfuscate it, you would see that it had hard-coded C2 beacons in it, hard-coded URLs for C2 beacons. Those beacons had been in use for multiple scenarios, undetected. So what we staged was as if an APT had already had a foothold, but they were trying to expand it maybe to another branch office. But they got sloppy, they reused a payload that there was already a signature for, et cetera. These things happen. I'm testing my team to see how quickly do they dis disregard something because, oh, it appeared to have been mitigated. Yes, that was mitigated. But you failed to look deeper to see if you could learn something from it that might help you find something that wasn't mitigated, right? So, I mean, the, guys, the sky's the limit. I probably could have just talked about all the different types of scenarios that you could do in this environment, but, I mean, I'll leave it to your imagination. But these are the things you have to think about 
what would our team do in a really freaky situation like that? Like, would we be prepared? You won't know until you try it. You won't know until you test it. You won't know until you've got the muscle memory that it takes to do these types of things that don't happen every day. Unless you're RSA. Just kidding. Kidding. Yes. How do I handle opening up emails? Okay, that's a great that's a great question. So there, um, now, there are technologies that can do this. They can interact with like the DOM and like click on things automatically. Um, I'm not that cool. I don't have anything like that. So what we do is what we call, it's a white cell task. So it usually falls on the red team guy or maybe if you've got a sysadmin that's helping run the range during the environment, during the exercise, it would be a task item for them. Hey, we just fished Regina Buckley. Log, log on to that system, open the email, click the link, run the executable. There are ways to automate that. I just, I'm not there yet. Um, there are really expensive technologies and platforms that can do this. Some of you may be familiar. I'm very familiar. So my history, I, I didn't really go into a good bit of history on this, but uh, my time in the Air National Guard was spent largely in part going through simulations. Um, once a year, I go up to Virginia and run through a, an international cyber warfare simulation. And the things I've seen there are what prompted me to build this. Because I got there and I noticed that, hey, what do you know? We're a bunch of people, very skilled. We know what we're doing. But we don't do this but once a year. And it shows. I want to do this more often. We need to get better. This needs to be more, you know, of, of, a, of a comfortable feeling for us. And so that's why I built it. But environments like that, they've got all those cool tools. Lariat, you know, uh, there's all kinds of really cool user automation that, to simulate these things. But see, I'm a state agency. I've got to figure out how to do it on a budget. So, chaff, Chrome extension, Python. Gets it done. Gets it done, trust me. And then, you know, when you do have to do that one thing, like open Outlook to click an email and open an attachment, that's a 30 second inject for your white cell team. Yeah. Oh, but, you know, that reminded me of one point, though. There's one rule that I stick to when I'm writing these scenarios, and I would advise you to do the same. Do not, do not give in to the temptation to game it, the system, a little bit. Everything that you do should be organic. It should, you should be using the same tactics attackers use. Because if you do something out of the ordinary, you know, and you, know, you might have a technical limitation that means, oh, I need to side channel. I just need to like load a CD-ROM on the virtual machine of this workstation so I can put this binary on it undetected. That's unfair. It's unfair to your incident response team. You didn't even give them the opportunity. So you need to up your skills in how are you going to deliver this attack because if you start side channeling and gaming the system, it's going to drive down the value of the training. It's going to demotivate your team because they're going to say, really? You did it that way? We were never going to find that. That's dumb. And they're not going to want to play next time. So keep, keep it real. You know? Keep your, your scenarios real. But Ming's coming to kick me off stage. Thanks, sir. Everyone, Bob Newhart, everybody. Bob Newhart.